may remain seated. Let's bow our heads in prayer. O Lord, grant us the rhythm of repentance and forgiveness in our day-to-day -day lives. Grant us also sincerity and faith through Christ our Savior and Good Shepherd. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, there is a saying from the book of Ecclesiastes written by the wisest man in the world, King Solomon, a phrase that weaves its way through that entire book, and the phrase is this, there is nothing new under the sun. That's a phrase that really sticks with me, not only being a Christian, but especially being a pastor. I like to understand those words in this way. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And I say that in, re re or in relevance and in reference to the Old Testament of Scriptures. I can't count the number of times during my ministry where I've heard members, people I've served, and other Christians say things like this. The Old Testament really doesn't have anything to say to us today. The Old Testament doesn't have any relevance. Those people were so primitive and so far away from us that really there's nothing to speak to us. Today we're more a sophisticated type of people. We're more complicated. We face things that these people never face. And so really we need to focus on the New Testament. That's still a few thousand years away from us, but really that has more to speak to us today because it really hits home more. And the first thing that comes to my mind, not always to my mouth, is this. Oh, really? That's what you think? Maybe the first thing that will come up into my mind, and actually out of my mouth, will be this. Are you really so certain about that? Because there's nothing new under the sun. The more things change, the more they stay the same. If we happen to think that we're more sophisticated to people who lived in the Old Testament, I can tell you, then you've never read the Old Testament. You've never really dug into it, and you don't have to dug, dig in too far to see that these people lived in societies similar, if not identical, to ours today, but also, they had sinful natures that were no different than ours, temptations that were no different than ours, and the same devil tempting them that tempts us. And I see that in God's Word this morning as we move on into another book of the Old Testament, to the book of Judges. A different time in the, in the history of God's Old Testament people. We had fo followed them so far from slavery in Egypt, to the promised land, to God giving them the promised land, to their new leader Joshua, and have, helping them to, 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 to take over the land and giving them that land in conquest. And when Joshua had been leading the people, we're told that God had blessed his people. They were living with blessings that were more too numerous to count. And God took care of them. But then, as we get to the end of the life of Joshua, we get to a, uh, to a people where in the book of Judges, we're told, and this phrase comes up over and over through the book of Judges, and there arose a generation who no longer knew the Lord. And that phrase comes up over and over again. Or another verse like this, everyone did as they saw fit. Does that sound like that's unsophisticated? Does that sound like something that we can't relate to today? I don't think so. We see a people that had been faithful to the Lord, and then they start drifting away. And by the time we get to not long after God's fearless leader Joshua died, these people rarely, barely, remembered the Lord, and they were following other gods. What led, what led to this? 
to where God could see everyone was doing as they saw fit and there arose a generation who no longer remembered the Lord. What were they doing? First of all, we got to see if this doesn't fit in today. We found a people who at this time, they decided that God was being a little bit too harsh. When God had commanded his people entering the land to drive out the inhabitants because they would be a thorn in their side, the people were thinking to themselves, that was a little bit harsh. They had followed that under Joshua, but when Joshua died, the project wasn't done yet. The people thought to this, thought this, well, you know what, wouldn't it be a little bit more humane? Wouldn't it be a little bit more loving if we let these people here and submitted them to slavery? And then, then they have a chance to come to the Lord. Oh, that's a great idea. But that's not what God said. What happened after that? These people had an influence on their spiritual lives. The, the, the natives that they didn't drive out of the land like God had commanded. They were worshiping what we heard in our text, terms for gods in the land of Canaan. The Baals, which was just another word for Lord or Master. And then the Ashtoreths, which was another word for the female gods in the land. But all of these gods were based on fertility. The more that you would worship these gods, the more fertile you and your land would be. The more you worship, the grains would fall on the land and the crops would grow and the more money you would make. The more you would worship these gods, the more children that you would have to work and take care of you and build up your estate. Now, imagine how God felt about that. The God who says, I'm the one who causes the rain to fall, the sun to shine, and the crops to grow. I'm the one who has created you and gives you the mind and the ability and the strength to work. I am the one who sends you your blessing. I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God. He's the only God. And the people thought, well, this is appealing. You know what? What we're going to do is we're going to mix this in, worship with God. Actually, we're all trying to get to the same place, aren't we? We can worship these Baals and these Ashtoreths, and we can also worship God. He's not going to mind a divided allegiance. They angered God. They aroused his wrath. And then they came up with another excuse. Okay? They came up with another excuse. This excuse was... Uh, and, and, and actually it was their sinful natures rationalizing even more intensely. Have you ever wondered why throughout the course of Old Testament history, God's people constantly went back to worshiping the Baals and the Ashtoreths? In order to worship these gods, you had to go to their temple, and inside the temple, they had male and female prostitutes. And the way that you worshiped these gods was to go in and have relations with those temple servants. Can you see the appeal? Unsophisticated people. There are things back then that don't speak to us today. These people were living in a sexually driven society. There's a word, there's a reason that God was saying they were prostituting themselves to these people. God had a marriage relationship with these people by redeeming them and being their God. He was their groom. They were his bride. But they were dividing their allegiance. Doesn't sound to me too much different than today. Where we think, and many people think, oh, God's word is just too tough. We think that we know better. We can get along in this world and divide our allegiance. And that is the loving, accepting thing to do. And what it, all it does is leads us and others farther and farther away from God. God didn't tolerate this with his people. We're told that he allowed their enemies to come in and torment them. And in this day and age, Israel had no king. They had, really didn't have army. They had their little different villages and tribes that would have amassed their own army and leaders. The people were miserable. 
God basically, it says, it says in our text that he allowed their enemies to come in and torment them and make them miserable. Because God was not going to condone their sin. He wasn't going to approve of it. And God never condones sin. He never turns a blind eye. We all have a sinful nature like these, like God's people here in the book of Judges. And had God not intervened, all of these people would have gone to what they deserve, to eternal damnation and hell. That's what we deserve as well. But then we're told that God sent to these people after periods of time, once he got their attention, once they cried out in repentance and for his help, he sent them deliverers, judges. Not in the term that we think of a judge today who sits in a courtroom and, and, and settles disputes. These were what you would call military heroes that would arise at different times over a 300 year period of time before they had kings and they would come and deliver God's people. Defeat, help them to defeat their enemies. You could call them, in a way to speak, little saviors. Once again, and they would deliver God's people and then the pattern would start again. Things would go well. We're told another generation arose who no longer remembered the Lord. One generation died who, who went, went to their ancestors, went to their fathers. And what a beautiful confession of faith in the resurrection to eternal life. Dying and going to your fathers. What a beautiful promise of the resurrection when we think about that here in Easter. One of the things that keeps us going, keeps that spring in our step as God's people, knowing that when we get to heaven, there's going to be a blessed reunion with those we love who have trusted in Jesus. Then another generation would come up and God would allow their enemies to oppress them. After periods of time, long periods of time, they would repent, cry out for God's mercy, and send another deliverer, another savior. In those judges, we see a picture of Jesus, a savior. And while those judges, those human beings, they had their faults. And we're going to get to hear about some of these judges in the coming weeks. Men like Gideon. Men like Samson. And let me tell you, those guys weren't crystal clear lives of, uh, they weren't lives of holiness. These men had some severe character flaws. Sinners. They needed a savior too. But the Lord sent them. They're not like Jesus, perfect in every single way, was without sin, the one who came into this world and lived a perfect life in our place, the one who suffered the death that we deserve, laid down his life for the sheep, and then was raised to eternal life to guarantee us that we stand before our Lord and Savior perfect because of the perfection that he has given us through faith. What a beautiful blessing that is. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful deliverer we have. A good shepherd who saves us wandering sheep. Who brings us back, comes out, looks for us, saves us, brings us back. And then we wander away. We don't deserve a Savior like that. And we also see the Savior in, in this section in another place. The words have just become for a, before our text. The writer of Judges tells us, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Hokim and said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you into the land I had promised to your fathers. I also said, I will never break my covenant with you. You are not to make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. And going on, the angel of the Lord, God himself, Jesus, before he took on human flesh, came and warned his people about their sins, but then reminded them too about God being faithful to his side of the covenant, never breaking it. And what a good shepherd we have in Jesus, our Savior, the one who never drops the ball while we do. Now let's never get, be mistaken here, okay? If we ever start thinking to ourselves, ah, it really doesn't matter, the Lord's always going to be there, that's our sinful nature. <coughs> And God is faithful. 
when he does have a limit to draw, he's patient. But we never know when that limit is going to stop. And so we don't dare take that for granted. When we do that, when we say, oh, that doesn't matter. God's grace is going to be there. He's never going to leave me. And we use that as an excuse to wander into sin. That's a statement of unbelief. And we need a stark, strong dose of God's law to show us our sin, to show us that we deserve hell, to lead us to sorrow for our sin. And that's when the Lord comes back, picks us up in his arms, and leads us back to the fold. What a wonderful blessing. Light in the dark age. Light in our Savior. Because of him, we not only have the confidence of heaven, because of him, we have the motivation, the reason, to live lives of joy, lives that reflect the love and the light of our Savior, lives that shine the light on our, to shine our Savior's light into this dark world so that others might see him. What a blessing. During this Easter season, we have time to rejoice, time to thank God for that gift of eternal life, but most importantly, in our perfect, victorious Savior who stops at nothing to save us and to keep his keep to keep his promises. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll confess our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. You can find those words on page 11 in the front of your bulletin.